Chris Gray, I'm the Managing Director of our Manpower Brand here in the UK. And I just want to say thank you in the first instance for joining us today. I know a lot of you, especially um, the team who were training this morning, uh, you travel from distance, I've heard distances of Newcastle and Exeter. Well done getting down there, down there. I know you do this month in, month out, but um, good to have you down here today. Thank you to the spectators for joining us, and also thank you to Lambrook School for hosting and also Blind Cricket England and Wales for helping us make this happen. Um, I just wanted to say that this afternoon, firstly, is all about having fun. Um, it's also uh, about raising awareness from, on our part, um, learning about everything that uh, the visually impaired um, have to go through so that we can learn how to support you uh, in, in everything that we do in employment moving forward. But above all, it's about drawing inspiration from an amazing group of people. And of course, people with, visually, uh, with visual impairment face challenges than, which are greater than myself, certainly, every day. And it's just um, amazing how you can draw on attributes and personal characteristics such as tenacity, resilience, determination, motivation, and teamwork to get you through every day. And, um, overcome these problems and challenges um, which seem ordinary to many of us. But um, you know, I, I know you all have your own stories, but I'd just like to draw on her sound story, which was in The Guardian um, a few months ago, I think it was the sound. And I know your story is about, it started in, in, in Multan in Pakistan, and you woke up one morning, um, age nine, you were blind, and your sister followed the similar journey unfortunately and came to London in 1995 but cricket was what you were playing before you went blind and you fell out of love with it but came back into love with it through test match, test match special <coughs> um, and then of course uh, the Australian teacher in Linden Lodge um, and then of course joining through Metro and, and that love with cricket came back I think um, and, and in your journey you talk about meeting people who inspired you and, uh, and, and bringing the real you, the real Hassan, out. And, and of course, here you are now today, an international cricketer and media star. Um, you know, <laughs> inspiration indeed. And it's stories like that, that um, you know, where you draw on that character and those attributes that take people like Hassan and of course everyone else here in this, this, this visually impaired cricket team through your incredible journeys. And it's stories like that that we as an employment agency need to learn about, to share with our clients who are you know, struggling, to be quite honest, with finding talent to help them deliver their services to their business, to their clients in turn. And um, what we talk about nowadays in Manpower is the human age. And the skills shortage continues to grow, if that makes sense. And we are very keen to shine a light on untapped pools of talent. Um, and it's unacceptable that we have unemployment in the visually impaired community at around about 60 odd percent within the context of an unemployment rate of about 5% in the UK. And that's a, a you know, it's a, a sad statistic. And so we are inspired by not only you guys, but also people like Gary Dunford, who helped pull this together. Go yeah, just put your hand up because uh, you've been very much concerned with this. Um, and then of course people like um, John who, who heads up Blind Cricket at England and Wales um, who, who do this every month, every week, um, making these things happen. And we're delighted to be here, have our own team to play you today. Um, and uh, I know it'll be very competitive. And you all look great in your new kit by the way guys. And uh, it looks fantastic. Um, and we want to play our part today and also in the future on and off the pitch. Um, I'd also just like to say thank you to the umpires, um, also in a very smart kit there in uh, green and blue. Um, I know you'll be um, managing us, you probably have more of a challenge managing our team okay, today, so please guide us. Um, John, I know you wanted to say a few words, yeah. so please um, First of all, big thank you to Chris and to Manpower UK and to Gary Dunford for getting this all together for us today. Great effort there. Uh, 
I'll tell you a little bit about Blind Cricket England Wales and, and the women's programme as well. First of all, I just want to thank a few more because I thank the umpires, as Chris said there, and the Brook School for letting us use their great facilities for the last year. Uh, I'd like to thank Jeanette, uh, the two Jeffs, uh, Lynn, uh, Mark Allen, and the new have been involved coaching as well over the last year. Thank you very much. And the reason I wanted to thank those people, especially, is that they're not the only ones around the country, that the volunteers, the helpers, make this, make this game happen as well. You know, the people that get up at 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning, pick people up all around the county, drive to the game, maybe make the tea, and sometimes umpire and score as well, before driving everybody home again. Uh, so they're the reason, one of the main big reasons why we've, we've gone from seven years ago when we started doing this, from seven teams in two competitions to, to 22 teams in eight competitions. And the same goes for the, for the women's, women's game as well. We, again, seven years ago, I think we had one regular uh, female player playing competitive blind cricket. Uh, we've got about 30 now, which probably equates to about 10% of the whole, uh, the, the whole competitions. Uh, as far as the women's, women's programme goes, we've been going for about a year now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I've been training regularly through last summer, um, played the first friendly last September, which went really well. Um, the plan is to play a few friendlies through, through this summer, really push it on, get some good match experience. And then, as with any international team, you, 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 when it comes to cricket, you've got to look a fair distance to find opposition. Uh, there are a few women's teams starting up now, India, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, West Indies come to mind, and we've had a, a, a provisional offer from, from the West Indies to play this time next year. So that's, that's the plan at the moment to work towards. Uh, we get a lot of funding, most of the funding in Blind Creek comes through the primary club. We have, most clubs have membership fees as well, but the primary club, without the primary club, we wouldn't be running the game as, as, as big as it is. Uh, they've given us some, some money for the for the, for the coaching and training so far and, and the women themselves are really making a great effort to do some fundraising. <coughs> uh, you may have seen the cycle challenge outside as you came with a couple of exercise bikes out there. I think the, the players, some of the players will be on there this afternoon while the match is going on, taking it in turns. So various bits and pieces, station collections we're planning around the country. So yeah, we, we're getting all that together and, and, you know, the, and, and the squad itself is, is really, you know, the, the travel from all over the country for this last year with their enthusiasm commitment and it's been unwavering hundreds of miles some of them and, and they still continue to do it. So yeah, that's, that's where we are with that. Uh, we, we're connected with the ECB, we signed an agreement with the ECB in 2008. Uh, we run all the, all the domestic competitions and the ECB take care of the England men's blind team, organise everything, fund all that. And, uh, when we get to a certain level, they'll do the same with the women's team and, and push that on. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's development, so it's still in the BCW. Everybody's happy with that, and we'll push things forward and, until we get to that level. And that's, that's really where we are with the women's programme. So thank you very much, and enjoy the, the game this afternoon. I'm going to pass you over to Hassan Khan. Hi guys, um, how do I follow those two? <laughs> Crikey, I, I just also want to say thank you um, to absolutely everyone involved uh, with organising today, particularly to Gary who invited me and to John. Uh, when I read the email I was like, wow, asking me to come and talk to all of you guys. It's an absolute honour being here. Um, as, as Chris said, um, I have a story. We all have a story. It's really, you know, how we tell it, it's really who's brave enough to come out. And, I, and I've come out because I want to inspire people. I want my story to work and people like Manpower, organisations like Manpower to pick it up and say, we're going to help blind people to get into employment. Because that's that my passion, apart from cricket. Now, the way my life began was uh, in a sort of like a tragic way in that I was three years old in a village of 400 people, woke up one morning and had lost both my eyes to a failure of the optic nerve. Uh, my life changed in that from then onwards to the age of 9, 10, I had absolutely nothing. I mean, you, you name it. Um, I didn't watch TV. I didn't watch cartoons. Um, I, I didn't actually have any toys. I was just, I was neglected because there was a lack of understanding. A lack of understanding when it came to disability in my village. But what, how that left me was quite a damaged little child because I didn't understand disability. I, I always assumed that I was going to be a useless human being who, when I grew up, 
I could potentially earn money by being a beggar on the streets of Pakistan. But that is what reality was. And people laugh when they hear it in this country, but that's God on his truth. That was what was actually going to face me. Until um, my sister lost her sight at the age of three, and the doctors invited me to come here, and they did some tests on us. And uh, I started to go to school, and I remember at the age of ten, my first ever day of schooling, at the age of ten, uh, September 25th, 1995, I went in and someone wrote my name in Braille. Of course I couldn't read Braille, but I felt it and it said Hassan. I had tears in my eyes. I went home and I said, I'm not going back home. I want to begin a life. I want to show myself and those people who doubted me that I could be something, that my eyes are not the only barrier. There's a lot more to me than just my eyes. I started studying really hard. I learned English, Braille in six months. But there was something missing in my life, and that was sport. I love sport. Um, for my 12th birthday, I was given a Walkman. And uh, during lunch breaks, I, I started tuning into TMS. And that really helped me improve my English, it helped me learn and adore the game that I once knew as a three-year-old, which was cricket. Uh, my Australian teacher introduced cricket to me at school with the big size three ball that we play in the league. And I was into it. And, and at the age of 16, Jeff, who's here, Jeff Smith, came to my school looking for young blind cricketers to go to Lords, the home of cricket. When I was blind in Pakistan, I forgot to dream because it wasn't for me. Um, I started to dream again. I joined Metro at the age of 17. And on my first day of training, I thought um, it'll be a couple of blokes hitting the ball about, nothing big. I turned up and there's 40, 50 year old guys playing cricket. And they're talking about wives, having good lives, everything that was normal, but not to me. I thought, how many days are you going to have that that's actually a, a school day? Every day was a school day for me, I was learning. And two years later, to cut a long story short, two years later, I picked up my bat for England in Sri Lanka. That was my dream, to wear an international shirt. And, um, well, looking back now, I've, I've played for England 32 times. I've been to India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, South Africa, Australia. Extremely, extremely humble, lucky. But I've worked for it, I have worked for it, and I think the other passion for me was to actually work for a charity, to make a difference to other blind people. It's very well me being blind and feeling sorry for myself and actually coming out of it on the other side. But could I help other people? But I work for Thomas Bocklington Trust. Um, we are a sight loss charity and we help blind and partially sighted people. Um, we home them, we, we, we organise outings, trips for them to save them from isolation, depression and a lot more. Um, and I think manpower being here is, is an amazing thing because not enough of us are working. I mean, for example, when I was searching for a job, I, I, I wasn't working for six years. I was begging for jobs. I was filling out job application after job application, and I was being turned down. There was research into people say, organizations say, well, actually, employers are turning people away because of their sight. And it's sad. I went to teach Braille for a year, and the employer was told, you can't employ him because he doesn't have a teaching qualification. My boss in Ballam Centre was partially sighted and she said, no, 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 I'm sure he'll do a good enough job. And I started that job and six months later, I was into a full-time employment. That's the difference it made to my life. Now, can we, all of us, manpower, BCW, can we all combine to make women's cricket, which it needs to be supported, bigger, better, so, then that, so that they can compete on the world stage like I do. And also, can we help blind people get into work? Because we all deserve the same opportunity that Hassan had, speaking in third person now, uh, <laughs> that, Has, that Hassan had and, and everyone else that we've had. Uh, now, we're so good at building walls, can we, can we build bridges? And I hope we can from today. Thank you.
and I haven't really prepared for this, so excuse me if I get out of it. Um, just on behalf of all the girls, I really want to say thank you to absolutely everybody that's come today. It makes such a difference to all of us. Um, and just to be able the opportunity to play a game, to learn, um, and hopefully you guys can learn from us as well. It's, I think it's gonna, it should be a really good day, and we're all looking forward to it. Um, I mean, from the girls' point of view, we love the game. I mean, we all travel from miles and miles away, but because we love the game, um, we come back every session. Well, even when we were injured, one of our girls fell down the stairs yesterday. She's come up to me and said, Lois, I fell down the stairs yesterday. I'm a bit bruised, but I'm still playing, all right? <laughs> I don't think I had a choice whether she was playing or not. But no, there's 100% commitment from these girls, and we're, we're really, really looking forward to today. Um, so if I go on to talking about the game, um, about how we play it, I think that's the main aim of me talking. So um, today, in blind cricket, the difference between mainstream cricket is obviously mainly in the ball, the main difference. Um, you have different classifications of sight. So um, I'm actually going to pick on people and I haven't told them. Can I have Heaven come towards me really quickly? Just stand up where you are. Yeah. Okay, so Helen is um, what is classified as a B1, and she's going to describe to you now her vision. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I've played the game for a, a while, um, and basically, when you're bowling, you can either be left handed or right handed, and left handed for bowling, and right handed for batting. Um, but it, playing this type of game has helped when I play for Durham as well. So you like improving at one game on the other at the same time. Yeah, so how much can you see Helen? I've got no sight whatsoever. I can't even see right at all. So thank you Helen. Um, so Helen's classified as B1. Uh, the adaptions for B1s are um, when you are bowling, you have, well throughout the whole game you have to wear black blackout shades. If you're because they're classified as a B1 the, the shades are just to make it equal, uh, because some, so uh, very rarely, I think there's a, I don't know if anyone knows the actual fact, there's a small percentage of people that actually have absolutely no vision at all. I mean, people look at you on the trains and stuff, and they go, oh, they're totally blind, and, they, and I can, I have a cane, and people look at me, and I'm like, I see you staring at me, by the way, but they don't know that, <laughs> and I feel like saying something to them, but I can't. So there's a small percentage of people that actually are totally blind, so the aim of, of the blackout shades is, you get adapted rules of being a B1, so it makes it even. And then it goes down to a B2, who, Mandy Mandy, yeah. is going to explain to you her vision. Um, I've got retinitis pigmentosa, so it means it's a deteriorating hating eye condition. I've got 10% vision in the centre left, all my peripheral vision night vision is gone. So I can see everything in the centre, but nothing around. So I still have some useful vision, but not a lot. Okay, thank you, Mandy. Um, so that's the next classification. And then you go slightly up more, which is B3. Um, I'm a B3, so I have, here you go, aniridia, nystagmus, rhodophobia, glaucoma, and cataracts. Um, so basically, um, my eyesight's look like looking out of the wrong end of binoculars. So I don't have a large peripheral vision, but what I see in my central is not too bad, but not perfect, but my peripheral's a little bit more than, say, Mandy, who's a, who's a B2. So it's all different. I mean, sometimes uh, we have B3s who, um, the B1s who think they can see everything, so then throw the ball at their face and go, oh yeah, I forgot you can't see, sorry. It happens all the time. It's all part of the game and all part of the fun. Um, and days like today, we're all still learning. I mean, I've been saying since I was 11, which I've got a mix not that long ago, considering I'm only 18. <coughs> but it's every single game is a learning curve. Our first ever game, we batted all right, didn't we? And then the next game we bowled better, and then the next game we bowled, we batted better but didn't bowl so well, and it's every single game. Just by the, we came the game on Saturday, didn't we, John? And by the end of the game, <coughs> it's so much better than when we first started. It's about coming as a team, and whether you, it's communicating because you've got some people who can't see that, as much as the maybe a B3 compared to a B1, but you don't really notice the difference. I'm going to use Hassan as an example here. When, when I play for Sam as well as Hassan, when we're walking off the pitch, he'll ask people to grab onto his arm and start walking off. And we're like, Hassan, but you can't see either. Where are you going? He don't care. We'll walk them into anything. <laughs> <laughs> he 
is, um, I mean, my boyfriend's got autism. He calls all the everyone the ladies blindies. It's funny. If you say you hear someone else say it on the train, if my if you heard a random person say to a blind lady, "Oh, come on, you blindie," I think you might kind of worry, wouldn't you? But in our eyes, it's actually fine. It doesn't bother us. I mean, that's what we hope today from you guys is that you can all interact just like anybody else with us, like we will with you. And we hope to help you and the guys in the fat manpower about learning how to make things adaptable for people. Because just as much as if there's a learning difficulty or physical disability, everybody has the equal rights. And it's, I've seen a one, saw one programme where there was what they call the norm, and then everybody else was disabled. But the one norm person walking around was the odd one out. But that doesn't actually mean they're the odd one out because everybody can communicate. No one ever needs to be the odd, odd one out. And hopefully you'll notice that on the pitch today. Um, yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll probably get a few bumps and bruises, you get a few people walking into each other. But <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all part of the fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, John. Thank you, thank you very much. Match time. Oh, oh, on, John. oh sorry, sorry. Go okay, just just for one thing, my mate. Um, Simon from uh, one of our clients from Eon has kindly agreed to say a few words about um, some of the journey that you've gone on with applying to say, people with visual impairments. Um, kindly agreed to say a few words. Told last minute that they'd like me to share some stories. So uh, completely unprepared. But thank you very much. Um, so my name is Simon Fox and I'm head of resourcing for Eon, um, and we're fortunate enough that Manpower are one of our key strategic recruiting partners. Um, it's not our journey, E.ON is massively committed to the inclusivity agenda, to helping people back into work, and one of the reasons we work so closely with Manpower is because they're committed to the same journey with us, and that's a hugely important part of the, uh, the partnership we have. And there is a story that I have to share, but because I was only told that I was sharing it on the lawn, I'm afraid I haven't read it so, to my shame, I cannot remember the colleague's name. But for anyone that's worried, I can't remember my children's names, so hopefully <laughs> we're about fine. Um, Manpower recruit into our contact centres for us. They provide us with temporary labour, but very often we take those people on as permanent employees. And there is one particular colleague, and I want to call her Miriam, but that may well not be her name. We took her on, we have no issues with helping anyone back into the workplace as long as we can make suitable adjustments for them because we know the power that that workforce brings for us. With, and I'm going to keep on calling her Miriam, which as long as that's her name is fine, um, we made adjustments to make the workspace effective for her. So we use um, speech to text and vice versa software. We changed the positioning of her desk to enable her to uh, get in and out of the building easily, including moving her downstairs when her office was meant to be upstairs. Um, but Miriam has a, um, a guide dog, um, and it wasn't quite working out with the guide dog. So, um, Hassan, you talked about uh, tearing down walls. We built walls. In fact, we built an entire pen. We built a pen for the guide dog outside, which backs onto the building, and we moved Miriam's desk so that she could sit by it. It's a, it's a fantastic story in terms of helping Miriam back to work. Um, but more importantly for me, we share the story quite a lot when we go to events, but the reason we share the story is it's been brilliant for whichever contact centre it is. Miriam's a part of that culture. The dog is now a part of that culture. Having that sort of individual in our organisation, showing her passion for life, her enthusiasm, her willingness to get over any obstacle that's in her way, and our shared, and manpower shared willingness to do the same, has been fantastically powerful to help people around her, to help people like me remember how easy it is to make these adjustments, how easy it is to help people back to work. But when you do, how fantastic it is for them, for us, and ultimately for E.ON, for our customers. So days like today, hugely proud to be a part of this, hugely proud to be able to support, and really looking forward to, to make an idiot of myself for the course. Thank you very much.